Hi folks, I'm Nathan with Two Guys Ride. Today we're out here in Granite Falls, Minnesota, and we're here at the Fagan Fighters World War II Museum, and we're here with Evan Fagan. Evan, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. So before we start talking about the airplane, I do yeah. want to apologize for the sounds that you're hearing, but it is pouring outside and we're in the hangar. Yep, that's right. Uh, so we get a, we're getting a little residual sound from the rain falling on the tin roof. So, but tell us uh, what we got behind here. All right, well, this is a, a 1945 Grumman Hellcat F6F-5. Um, you know, this was the Navy's most successful fighter with a 19 to 1 kill ratio. This airplane was designed to take off of the fire aircraft carriers, get up to altitude, and fight the Japanese. And at the time, uh, the Hellcat filled a vital role of being an aircraft carrier fighter. Uh, there was another airplane called the Corsair which was a very good fighter as well, but it was having problems with carrier qualifications because of the big gull wing and not being able to see so well. Well, that was the one that was the dipped wings. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. And, and actually, if you look at this, it has a little bit of that It has, it, it does have a little bit of a dip. Um, but the Grumman, you can see very good off the front forward side of it. Um, had nice wide gear, it was very good for ship shipborne missions. Um, and the, the Hellcat came in right when it was needed. Um, it was an improvement from the, the Grumman Wildcat, which is also a great fighter. But they took the Wildcat and tried to improve it to make it a, a better fighter, better ground handling, and they came up with the Hellcat. And that's what this is. It's got a Pratt & Whitney 2800, which is 2,000 horsepower, a lot of performance, a uh, big prop hanging out in front of it. Um, just an absolute great fighter. So this was the the, um, the or the Wildcat, I should say, was the predecessor to the Hellcat. Yep. And you can see well, the yeah. stance you talked about, like between yep. the wheels and just the sheer yep. size of it. Yep. The Wildcat, like the Hell, like the P40, was what the Navy had when we basically were attacked on Pearl Harbor. And in the more advanced version of that, the Hellcat, which is a different airplane, but it's the Navy fighters wanted to have an improved airplane based on the Wildcat and the Hellcat was designed. And it's a, it's superb, I mean, it's a wonderful airplane. All right, well, let's let's walk uh, right up to the wing here. Uh, again, I've noticed this, and I noticed this on another airplane, but, yep. you know, 90% of the surface is, is aluminum. Right. But you've got this wrap, um, yep. I call it a wrap, yep. I, it's, 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 yeah, the controls, but it's not metal, is my point. Right, the control surfaces on a lot of the the uh, World War II aircraft, even today, are used out of fabric, and a lot of times it's because it's lightweight, it's cheap, it's easy to repair. Um, and that's, if you look it up, that's what you're gonna find. It wasn't always a scientific reason, but it's very lightweight, um, and it did the job for control surfaces, which really controlled your turning, your, your yaw, your coordinating with your ailerons and your rudders and um, climbing and uh, essentially called control surfaces. So, uh, yeah, and obviously it worked because, then, I mean, they never, the pilots never came back and said, no, these keep ripping at so much of an altitude or a speed right. or anything, so. Yeah, and it, with a fabric control surface, I mean, if you get a hole in it, you can take a couple pieces of duct tape, go over the top of it, and you're good to go. Wow. Until you can pull it off and repair, recover it. Now, uh, on the top of the wing, we have got, of course, your guns. Yep, so the, gun base. Um, and then ammunition, your ammunition boxes. box. Yep. Did they have a tuner on those, like they do on some other airplanes on the wing guns? For for sighting the guns in, I think they're internal okay. uh, adjustments on there, so they'd have the, the doors open. Um, but they would load the ammunition and and service the guns from up top here. Okay. Uh, the, the doors come open, and we have the, you know, not the real 50 calibers in here. We do have the, the dummy guns in here. But the Hellcat had six 50 caliber Browning machine guns which is very common with a lot of the fighters. Three on each wing. Three on each wing, yep. All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's walk up here to that front of that wing. Okay. I, I notice how much taller this is because I can walk under this wing at the right. end of it right. and not have to bend my head down. Which yeah, is, it's a big airplane. Um, now, we were talking a little bit earlier because I noticed this. Yep. And it completely floored me as to what it was. So what, what and there's two of them, so what yeah. are these? They're gun cameras, which, which allow the uh, confirmation for kills and also doing some type of surveillance, but they would be able to take reconnaissance uh, and the, the pilot who flew this airplane, not this exact airplane, but one of the pilots of death and destruction, 
uh, would talk about some of the surveillance they would do on certain missions. Uh, one of the missions he, they, when they were done doing their ground strafing, they were taking surveillance of the POW camps in Japan. Um, and then after the war, they also flew around and did surveillance of concentration camps as they were liberating the POWs. Um, you know you always hear about you know, spy planes or whatever, but yeah. those are planes that are specifically designed to take pictures right. and fly to high altitudes. I personally had no idea that fighters in this era had cameras yeah, there mounted was, in the wings. There was fighter squadrons, uh, like for instance, European theater. There was P-38 Lightnings that were just photo recon airplanes. Okay. And prior to the D-Day invasion, uh, a lot of these photo reconnaissance guys would go in, take pictures of the beaches and stuff. And when they would land, they would get them on an airplane and send them back to the U.S. because they were afraid that if those people were captured by the Germans and interrogated, they might tell them what they were doing they to were give doing. information on the invasion. So when those guys landed from their missions, literally they put them on a C-47 and shipped them home right away for fear that the Germans would get them if they were shot down and interrogate them. But they had airplanes designated just to take photos. No ammunition wow. or anything. Wow. Yep. That is a really neat piece of history. Now, uh, what is the significance of the 115 on the flap? So this is the, the landing, obviously the landing gear for the airplane. And this, mm -hmm. this flap here with the number indicates the number of the airplane. So if in the mission ready room, they would be assigned airplane number 13. They'd go find 13. That was the airplane they were flying that day. This happens to be 115. In the Navy, a lot of the guys were not assigned a permanent fighter. They were assigned a number for that day, and they would essentially go out, find that number, and fly it. Um, so so the, it wasn't even their own personal airplane. No. I mean, like the one they flew all the time. They would fly an assigned number. And if you go to the other side of this airplane, and the thing that was unique about this airplane is the nose art, which is death and destruction. Not a lot of Navy airplanes had nose art. But this airplane was flied by several naval aviators, Don McPherson being one of them, who's a the gentleman we painted it after. Um, but he flew this airplane on occasion, but flew a number of airplanes, and not just one airplane. Okay. So the kills on the airplane, Don, for instance, had five kills, but there's nine depicted, and Don couldn't even tell you whose kills are all depicted on this airplane. So it's really neat in the fact that a lot of different guys flew. Flew, and, and everyone would put that same I'm assuming that's like a sticker, a vinyl sticker or something that they yeah, throw, throw on there? Yeah, but they'd have a stencil that they'd paint okay. during the war. All right. Yeah, so, more crude so application. Whatever, between the combination of pilots, there were nine total kills on this. Right, yep. Wow. Man. Now, I'm assuming that these are vents for the front engine? Yeah, those are, those are cowl flaps. Okay. So they allow heat to escape from the engine. And just talking about sheer size, I was standing in front of this propeller, but it's about as tall as me. Yeah, it's it's a I very mean, even tall, down on the ground. I mean, I, it's a Ham standard Hamilton standard propeller, which is a very common type of prop. Um, hydromatic propeller, which means it's operated by oil. Okay. Where the original Wildcat had a Curtis electric prop, which was an electric motor that drove the pitch of the blades. Okay. This is drip pitched by oil. Um, and it's a three. It's a three. This yeah, is a it's, three it's blader. Three, three blades. And okay. a lot of the later fighters, like the, the Mustangs and the Corsair, um, and the P-47, had four-bladed props. Um, where the, the Hellcat here had a three-blade, never had a four-blade. Okay. Maybe they had an uh, experimental version of it, but I, I don't believe they did. All um, right. Let's let's walk to the back of this because this was designed to, to uh, take off from an aircraft carrier. Yes and land if, if, if needed there too. So the, uh, I don't know if they call it the catch hook or... Yeah, the tail hook. Tail hook right here. Yep. So this does extend out. I mean, yep. the pilot can hit a lever and this... It's actually electrically controls a switch and this would extend out and drop down and this would catch your wire. So does it is it like this piece all the way up to this piece? That's or is it just this top piece? It's that comes a solid up? hook that okay. comes back, and it's it's a, a longer rod that comes back. It probably comes back a good four feet. And then does that does something like go down? Then and this hangs down. Looks like a stinger on a hornet or a bee. Okay, very good. And then it drags on the deck and it catches that arresting wire. And so you're like, literally flying feet off the deck. Yes. And you're bringing that airplane in, the signal officer is waving you in, and you do what he tells you to do, and he'll get you right where you're supposed to go. And 
I think they always, if I remember right, talking to Don, who was the 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 ace with this airplane, he said they would always their goal was always to hit the second wire. So that was always their goal to get that second wire. Interesting. Now, because they had, I believe they had four wires and then they had a net. So oh, okay. they'd raise a net too. But now, uh, yeah, you wouldn't ever want to hit the net. No. Um, so it, interesting sidebar, but related to the aircraft. When you're landing on an aircraft carrier back in World War II, those uh, signal the, the, signal you, officer yep. signal officers at the end. Tell us a little bit about that. About because the, the ship raises and lowers with the waves. Yeah, you, you know, and obviously I know I've never landed on an aircraft carrier and was never that. You know, those World War II pilots were the skilled aviators, but. When you're landing on an aircraft carrier, you're landing on a pitching deck, so you've got the pitching seas, and they would have landing signal officers, which are a couple pilots with paddles, and they would be essentially telling the pilot what controls to put input to account for the pitching deck. And it was their job to get those pilots as close to possible, and if they were having a problem or too low or too high, they'd wave them off to do a go-around and go come back and land ground. again to prevent an uh, accident from happening. Man. But I think they assign pilots those duties. I don't know how that exactly worked, but they were all pilots who were doing the signal officer. All right, so they knew. They knew how they to fly the airplane. See. Yep. Yeah, okay, so that's to land. Now in the event that this took off from an aircraft carrier, there's a different set of hooks. Yeah, so if we go up to the front, there's a set of catapult hooks. And they were used if the deck was short or if there was no winds, they'd have a steam catapult assist, which they would grab a hold of these hooks right here. And they'd Those hook up to a cable. Big, big hooks. Big hooks, yeah. They'd hook up to a cable, and it would be a steam catapult assist, which would get them accelerated very quickly um, if there was no winds. So if they on were, the bow of the if, deck. if they had an incoming wind, these would take off under their own power. Absolutely, they wouldn't. But sometimes, for instance, the front aircraft may not have much of a deck to take off on. They might do a catapult steam launch for him. But if you have good winds coming over your bow, a lot of times they wouldn't need to use the catapult assist. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Now, uh, up inside the cockpit, again, single pilot. Yep. Okay, no, no one riding with you. Um, any more advanced controls? I do see you have a bigger mirror. Yeah, there is a, a rear view mirror in this one as well. Um, you know, there's more advanced controls in here than there was in the Wildcat. You can see the gun sight oh, up there. Oh, much, it's much got more It's an electric modern. computed gun sight. Um, and it's got more of the, it's, a lot of the fighters have the same basic instruments. There's not a lot of technology that was added to these fighters as far as different instruments and gauges or different quality instruments and gauges. For the most part, they're steam gauges. Uh, the, the Hellcat had uh, backup uh, to the backup system for, for instance, your landing gear. If your landing gear, say your main hydraulic, normal means of putting your gear down were shot out, you had a, a emergency hydraulic uh, ability to lower your gear and if that okay. didn't go you could raise it or lower it with your nitrogen system which was your backup to your backup which was basically a lever you pulled down it would blow your gear down and it was a one-time thing but you had three different abilities to get your gear down with it and so that was pretty good for safety procedures oh for sure for sure yeah. um, now that rear view mirror, is that set enough so that you can actually see back through your tail? You can see back through your tail, yes, you can. It's interesting because on, on the older airplane we looked at, it was yep. actually above now. Yep. But this makes sense now. It doesn't get any condensation out from clouds or whatever. Right. And you can see through the canopy back your, your, your tail enough to where I would imagine if you had an airplane on your, on your six, you could see it pretty good. You could good. see it pretty good. Um, no, it just, it just kind of floors me, though, when you start to think about it. I mean, we use rear view mirrors in cars all the time. But to think that our pilots in World War II were using the same easy piece of, I'll call it technology, to try and spot enemy, it's like right. that's all they had besides, besides other turning. pilots. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yep. It'd be like a nervous wreck. 
Yeah, right, I mean, if you right. if you weren't know you know a, yep. sort of a man of steel right. about it, I mean that's just incredible to think that's what was keeping their six safe. Man, right. I'll tell you what. Well, Evan, thanks again for sharing us with us this piece of uh, of history, this Hellcat airplane. Um, what a, a beautiful airplane and a, and a neat part of our history in World War II. Uh, thanks again for sharing. Thank you for coming. Thanks for watching.